Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. This week, blowing the whistle on the Pentagon. Come on. The WikiLeaks Iraq video and how the story was or was not covered. Newsrooms and their reporters dressing up television dramas. Fact meets fiction in Israel. Racial tensions in South Africa explode on the air. Quote, the bloody agent. And Whitney Houston, we have a problem. Someone in Taiwan has stolen your song. The images came from a U.S. Army helicopter, and they showed an attack near Baghdad that killed 16 Iraqis, including two media workers. The video from July 2007 was released by WikiLeaks, the online whistleblowing site. A spokesman for WikiLeaks said the video was newsworthy because it took us inside the cockpit and proved that the men who ordered the attack and pulled the trigger ignored the U.S. military's own rules of engagement. And the coverage of this story has been revealing in its own way. It did not get the airtime in the United States that such an explosive piece of video clearly warranted. And Reuters, the news organization that had two employees killed in the attack, has been criticized for going easy on the Pentagon in the aftermath. Our starting point this week is a story that broke in Washington and rippled out from there. And what the coverage of the video says about news organizations and the way they cover the U.S. military. Looking at it, it was someone acting like God. That's a weapon. Yeah. They are superhuman, while Iraqi people were subhuman. They have individuals with weapons. They are high in the sky, shooting at uh, lower people. Light them all up. Come on, fire! It's uh, absolutely. For me, it was inhuman. Regardless of what you make of this video, what you know about military rules of engagement, whether you believe the soldiers really mistook cameras for grenade launchers, whether it was a war crime or just an honest, tragic mistake, the video was shocking. It was disturbing and it was news. Or at least, it should have been. Hotel 26 is Crazy Horse 20. What I find more interesting is the mainstream media reaction here in the United States because they've hardly covered the story at all. It's a fascinating story. It's an amazing story, and yet there's almost no coverage of it. Well, why is that? And why didn't it get released uh, to one of the networks? Why did WikiLeaks have to do it? It's because the networks wouldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole. To be fair, the New York Times had some very excellent coverage of the story. I think on television, Fox News, which is very conservative, is uh, really not going to touch any story that sheds the Iraq war in a bad light. A closer look at the raw video revealed a few things that WikiLeaks, to put it politely, missed. MSNBC, which is of course the very liberal network, was very happy to cover it because it shed the Iraq war in a negative light. The classified video is from a U.S. Apache helicopter. And then on CNN, they really played down what had happened and they really kind of uh, tried to talk about it without really talking about it. But people online were talking about CNN's coverage. This American blogger was tracking news sites and noticed the story was initially prominent on CNN's and popular with visitors. But then it disappeared. But CNN, all day almost, they had Tiger Woods and do people love their iPads as their top story. But you look at the links, you can see the most popular story by far is video shows journalists deaths in Iraq. The blogger's point, since when do news sites which make money when visitors click on their articles take down their most popular story? The media is not anymore just newspapers and television and radio, but it is the internet, bloggers, there are source watchers, and they play a very important role in, in widening the meaning of the media. But now let's actually look at the, the video and how they covered it. Let's take a look. CNN ran one minute and ten seconds of the video, including audio from the cockpit to commanders on the ground, but it did not show pictures of the original attack or of a second attack when a passing van pulled over to help the wounded. Let's bring in our Barbara Starr, our Pentagon correspondent. Uh, Barbara, this video, uh, what do we see from it? Because it looks like they were asking for permission to engage. That means to fire 
but we don't actually see the uh, shots being fired. We do not, Wolf. Out of respect for the families of the two Iraqi employees of the Reuters news organization that were killed in this, we are not showing uh, after the video that you just saw here. It gets very brutal. Uh, Out of respect for the families, she said. However, that same day, Al Jazeera spoke to the brother of the Reuters photographer who was killed. He consented to that interview. He wanted to speak. And a few days later, a CNN reporter based in Baghdad spoke to the families as well. The whole family was in pain, says Samer. His report showed them watching the video, but again, CNN did not show viewers the actual attacks. So, if the network wasn't holding back the video out of respect for the families, was it, as has been suggested, holding it back out of respect for the Pentagon? For news agencies operating in Iraq, and, and even more so now in Afghanistan, access is, is a key issue. It is in the interests of news agencies not to completely go against the Pentagon's line because they need that access. They need that access that the Army provides. A couple of more points from the CNN Pentagon correspondent. They reminded everybody they did investigate. No one was found at fault. Even Reuters today put out a statement reminding everybody war, very sad, very dangerous business, especially for the journalists who try and cover it. That Reuters statement was a story in itself. The video, it said, was difficult and disturbing to watch, tragic and emblematic of the extreme dangers that exist covering war zones. But the company, which failed in previous attempts to acquire the video, held back from criticizing the Pentagon. Gawker.com, a New York-based media blog, then reported that Reuters staffers felt the statement did not go nearly far enough. Reuters did not respond to our request for an interview, but the company's former chief editor, Michael Rupke, appeared on another blog saying, the flabby response to the shameful murder of Namir Nur el-Din and Saeed Shamak by reckless U.S. forces is not reassuring. What of their families? Why, he said of Reuters, do we leave it to others to make the running? It was a question one could put not only to Reuters, but to most of the U.S. broadcast media that either ignored the story or gave it short shrift. Come on. I mean, since 2003, you had six or seven years of the Bush administration just wrapping themselves in the flag of the military and turning the Iraq invasion into such a partisan, such a hotly politicized issue. Oh yeah, look at that, right through the windshield. Anything touching on that, such as this story with uh, this terrible video uh, in East Baghdad, is going to be very controversial. And for that reason, a lot of news agencies are going to be wary of touching it. And that's a shame. They have no interest in challenging our government or our military whatsoever. And it's because that's not what they're doing anymore. They're the corporate media. They're here to entertain. They're here to make money off their advertisers. But they are not here to do journalism. One small child wounded over. And what WikiLeaks did was journalism. Here's how our Global Village voices see the coverage of the WikiLeaked U.S. military video. The Pentagon obviously had to conceal the video. Footage like this is of utmost importance. It exposes a true face of U.S. hegemonies. Perhaps this also shows all military actions, routine or not, are recorded and therefore will eventually be available to all of us to see. This is just the tip of the iceberg. If you're tired of screaming at your television set, you might want to try talking to your webcam. We're always looking for new Global Village voices. The best way to get in touch is through Facebook and Twitter. Just go to those sites and look for the listening post page. We will let you know what stories we're working on so you can weigh in with an opinion on the coverage. Or you can reach us through email at listeningpost at aljazeera.net. Time now for Listening Post News Bites. A Japanese cameraman has become the first journalist killed in the clashes between soldiers and anti-government protesters in Thailand. Hiro Muramoto worked for the Reuters news agency, which we mentioned earlier in relation to that Iraq WikiLeaks story. Muramoto was shot in the chest covering the fighting in Bangkok. The red-shirted protesters are members of the National United Front of Democracy Against Dictatorship, they're demanding the resignation of Prime Minister Abbasid Vejajiva. They support the former PM, Taksin Shinawat, who was ousted in a military-led coup in 2006. It is not clear who was responsible for Muramoto's killing. Each side is blaming the other. 
According to various news sources, this is the last video that the cameraman recorded before he was shot and killed. Reuters' editor-in-chief, David Schlesinger, issued this statement. Journalism can be a terribly dangerous profession as those who try to tell the world the story thrust themselves in the center of the action. The entire Reuters family will mourn this tragedy. The Somali Islamist movement, Al-Shabaab, has banned radio stations in the country from broadcasting news programs that are produced by the British Broadcasting Corporation and the Voice of America. Al-Shabaab said in a statement that all FM stations in the area that they control, which is most of southern and central Somalia, including parts of the capital Mogadishu, must stop broadcasting programs made by the two outlets or face having their stations 